Standing on the promises I cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Well, good evening. It's good to see everyone in services uh, tonight. I had a great service this morning. Uh, great to see you this evening. Looking forward to uh, what God has in store with Pastor Bobby uh, speaking on wisdom tonight out of the book of James. And let's start with the word of prayer. Father, we are just so thankful for your goodness in our lives. Lord, I just uh, pray as we once again open up James tonight, we really want to once again hear from your word. Uh, we are thankful for it. Um, that is the centerpiece of every service here at Bible Baptist Church, Lord. Thank you so much for giving us your word. May you be glorified in the preaching. May you be glorified in your people responding to the word as well. Lord, bless this time, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Um, I'd like you to pick up your Bibles, if you would, and want to read some scripture this evening. And I want us to go to uh, Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. If you, you guys weren't here this morning, so you'll notice that uh, there's a new addition to uh, my wardrobe that I now have to wear when it comes to reading nowadays. And uh, so it's amazing how much better the print is now uh, when you wear glasses like this. It's incredible. Um, Matthew chapter number five, as uh, Pastor Bobby's going to preach on wisdom tonight, we're just going to look at the Beatitudes. Uh, this is the introduction to the greatest sermon ever preached, uh, the Sermon on the Mount uh, preached by Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to read verse three down through verse number 12. And here's the words of Jesus Christ as he begins that great sermon. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what, church? Filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus says rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The words of Jesus Christ, 
They're wonderful words of life. So let's stand together and let's sing that song, Wonderful Words of Life. Join me in singing, as Pastor said, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to his loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. The next song is God Has Spoken. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about this song, but just really think about the words. It's a really deep song, um, and it's just rooted in Scripture. There's a lot of Scripture that we can read that backs this up, but just really listen to the words as we sing it. God has whispered through creation, making all with let there be. His creative voice still echoes through the works we hear and see. Oh, what power, oh, what wisdom, oh, what kindness God has shown. God has whispered through creation he exists and may be known he exists and may be known god has spoken through the scriptures breathing out his sacred word spirit led the holy authors have declared the saith the Lord, teaching us of sin and sinners, of God's saving sacrifice. God has spoken through the scriptures, pointing us to Jesus Christ pointing us to Jesus Christ. God has shouted through the Savior, greatest word of God to men. Word made flesh, Christ took our nature, one of us without our sin. Jesus' highest revelation, seeing him is seeing God. God has shouted through the Savior, praise the living word of God. Praise the living word of God. Good singing, thank you. Amen. Good evening, church. Oh, I'm stuck on my mic here. 
This is not going to be good. There we go. Got it off. Good to see everybody in here uh, this evening. Looking forward to getting into God's Word and studying what James has to say about wisdom. So if you have your Bibles, a turn to James chapter number 3. James chapter number 3. Um, and pastor came to me before and said, what are you speaking on? And he was going to read a passage of, script, passage of Scripture, and I asked if he could read the Beatitudes. And I want to highlight this kind of before we read through our passage, uh, just so you can kind of make the connection. Uh, James talks about in this passage the difference between false wisdom and true wisdom. And as he describes what true wisdom is, he roots much of his teaching back in the teaching of Jesus in the Beatitudes. And you'll see the characteristics that James says, this is what real wisdom looks like. You'll see it echoed, James kind of drawing on what he heard Jesus teach there in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's read, starting in verse number 13. James says this, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above, and think about the Beatitudes here, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. James starts with a test of wisdom. He asks a question, who is a wise man among you? Now, this is a little bit like asking the question, the game show, who wants to be a millionaire, okay? Of course, we all know who wants to be a millionaire where nobody is not raising their head. Everybody at some point would like a little extra money, so it's kind of a foolish question. It's self-evident. Uh, similarly, most of us like to think that we are in some way possessing wisdom. When James says, who is a wise man among you? Maybe we would look around and say, well, I, I think I have some sort of wisdom in some area or another. I'm smart. I have things figured out. Uh, one author wrote that it is hard to find a self-professed fool. We may point to any number of things to validate our belief in our own wisdom. We could talk about our age. Well, I'm older, so that means I, I must, by default, I must be wiser. We could talk about our success at our jobs or education and degrees. I, I went to uh, high school and then college and then I went to graduate school or I have, a, I have this uh, certificate in my job. We could talk about the ways uh, that or the type of school we went to. I went to this high school or this university to show that, oh, okay, I am really wise. Maybe if you don't have formal education, you could reference all the study and research you do on your own. You could talk about being self-taught and how you can just figure things out on your own. You could talk about your street smarts or your business sense or your ability to cut through kind of uh, the, the, the fog and the mist of things and get to the bottom of what is really going on. Most of us don't think of ourselves as fools. I read a study this week that said the majority of Americans think that they are above average in intelligence. The majority of Americans, let that think so. That means there's a, a big group of people who are confused about how intelligent they really are. Of course we do. But scripture here gives us a test, a measuring stick to see whether or not we are actually wise. And it's found in the last half of verse number 13. James says, if you want to see who is a wise man among you, he says, this is how you tell. Let him show out of a good conversation or good conduct, his works with meekness of wisdom. For all the metrics that we could come up with to gauge whether or not someone is wise, James says it will be shown in their actions. Real wisdom and knowledge is revealed in a life full of good works and not a head full of information. Now, we live in the information age, don't we? We can, and I, my phone's on the front pew there, but I could pull out my phone and in seconds, I could get to the bottom of crazy amounts of information. I could go back to any point in history and find facts and information. I could see studies and I could see experiments. I could, if I wanted to, find out who the third king of Prussia was. 
I could find out what is the densest element, or I could find a program to teach me any instrument or any language, whatever my mind desired, I could find that. And we're full of knowledge, and yet we're not full of wisdom. We have a world full, maybe sometimes even a church full of people who have knowledge, but they don't use their knowledge in the right way. And so all the facts aren't doing them any good. If what you know right now is not leading you to good works, James says your knowledge is worthless. Just like faith, remember faith in chapter 2? It is an internal condition that leads to an outward manifestation. The same is true with wisdom. Wisdom is something that it starts on the inside, but it always works its way out into our actions. And if your perceived wisdom that you have is not resulting in meekness and good works, James says you might be deceived about what you really have. Now, I'll be honest. This is not what I would expect to be the markers of wisdom Wisdom to me seems to be an intellectual pursuit. Pursuit. If somebody is wise, that means they spend time studying and reading and thinking and uh, they think about and they wrestle with ethics and philosophy and they know how to, to kind of bring in information and sift it and make decisions based on it. But James says that we test our wisdom by activity, by what we do. He says attitude and actions Meekness and good works are the two ways that we see whether or not we are really wise. Meekness has to do with gentleness and self-control and humility. We read it in the Sermon on the Mount. The meek will what? The meek will inherit the earth. Jesus referred to himself as meek. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. In heart. So James starts out with this test of wisdom. Do you want to see if you are really wise? Well, evaluate your life. Are you meek? Do you have a life full of good works? That's the way you can tell. And then he goes on, he proceeds to kind of paint a picture for us. A picture of false wisdom and a picture of true wisdom so that we can have a good sense of where we fall out in this discussion of wisdom. I want you to imagine with me that you are walking into an art museum. You walk into an art museum, and there are only two pictures on display in this room. Everything is lit nicely. There's dark walls and nice lights, and there's benches for you to look. And on one wall of the museum, there's a picture of a man who looks arrogant and worldly and devilish. His shoulders are back, and his chest is out. Uh, the canvas is dark, and the strokes are bold and violent. They kind of stir up these emotions of almost intensity and anger and unrest. There are shadows that lead you to feel that something dark and foreboding is about to happen. The man is marching forward with chaos and destruction strewn out behind him. His eyes are fierce and haughty. This is a life from James' teaching of a man that is living after the wrong kind of wisdom, full of strife and contention and arrogance and deceit. On the opposite wall, there is a picture of another man. His demeanor is gentle and welcoming. His posture is relaxed and serene. His hands are open and they look ready like they are going to reach out and help in service to somebody. In the background, there are people that look like they have been blessed by this man. They're joyful and they're happy and they're prospering. There is a calm that seems to permeate out from the image. This is the picture of a life that is lived in the wisdom of God. And that's what verses 14 down through verse 17 lay out for us. A picture of false wisdom, man's wisdom, and a picture of true wisdom or God's wisdom. And the question for us tonight is, which one does your life most resemble? Are you this angry, contentious, dark, bitter, fuming, haughty person that is marked by strife and contention and stress and unrest? Or are you calm and benevolent? and merciful, and peaceful, and serene. And no matter what is going on around you, you can be settled and sure. James says, it is a result of which kind of wisdom you are living after. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to pray, and then we're going to walk through the passage and look at the two types of wisdom. So bow your heads with me, if you would. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you would help me tonight. As we look at this comparison 
between what it means to live after man's wisdom and what it means to live after God's wisdom. I pray that you would help each and every one of us in here to have lives that are marked by true wisdom that descends down from above. God, I pray that if there is things in our life that needs to be changed, if there are areas that we need to work on or attitudes that we need to get rid of, you would help us to do that hard work through your spirit. In your name, amen. First of all, we see in the passage, we're just going to walk through, we see the character of false wisdom. The character of false wisdom, starting in verse number 14, if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The first way you can see is if you, if you have false wisdom is if you're living a life that is self-seeking, is self-seeking. The, the main concept, the big idea surrounding the world's wisdom is that its eyes are always focused inward to what can be done for your own self. Bitter envy has to do with being unsatisfied and discontent with what you have and looking with jealousy at the eyes of others. John MacArthur wrote, those whose lives are based on, on and motivated by human ungodly wisdom are inevitably self-centered, living in a world in which their own personal ideas, desires, and standards are the measure of everything. Whatever and whoever serves those ends is considered good and friendly. Whatever and whoever threatens those ends is considered bad and an enemy. Those who are engulfed in self-serving worldly wisdom resent anyone or anything that comes between them and their own objectives. Now, my son is like this sometimes. He's three years old, and right now his only thought is how things affect him. Doesn't matter what is going on around him. Doesn't matter if his sister is screaming or if he's frustrating mom and dad. All he knows is he wants something, and he's going to let everybody know about it until he gets what he wants. If he's hungry, he expects me to stop what I'm doing, no matter what it is, and feed him. In fact, every morning, for some reason, I don't know why this is, he wakes up before us every single day, and he always jumps in our bed, and he jumps, and the first thing he says, hey, somebody get me Honey Nut Cheerios. He's, I don't know if he just doesn't eat enough at night, but he's really hungry in the morning, and he says it every single time, I want Honey Nut Cheerios, and he will push us and hit us and talk to us and whine until somebody fulfills his desires and goes and gets him food. He's self-seeking. Now, we can be that same way sometimes. Let me ask you a few questions. What happens when someone messes up your plans. Maybe it's at work. You had a, an idea, you had a routine, you had something, I've got to get this, 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 this done, and then somebody comes in and they blow it all up. What's your first response? Don't you know that I had a lot to get done today and now I have to stop and help you? It's self-focused. How do you respond to inconveniences? Maybe here at church, somebody's going to ask you for help on the weekend, moving or something. Maybe one of your kids is going to bring up a school project that they need help on. You thought, I had everything planned out, and now I'm inconvenienced. What is your response? When you plan your day or your week out, are most of the tasks focused on benefiting you, or is there consideration for how you can serve others? We're self-seeking. Man's wisdom is always focused on self, and it manifests that selfishness through jealousy. Our eyes may be looking outward, but our focus is inward. I look at John, and even though my eyes are looking at him, I am jealous because I want something that he has. And so even though I may be looking at others inwardly, my focus is still on self. It's not that just we just want a promotion. That envy leads to bitterness when somebody else gets it. It's more than simply desiring a nice house or car or clothes. It's frustration when we see how God has blessed someone else and not us. It's the inability for us to look at the lives of others and rejoice with those who rejoice. Somebody goes on a nice vacation, our first thought is, well, it must be nice to be them, or I wish I could do that, or I seem to be more faithful at church than them, and yet they are here going and traveling all over the place. Why hasn't God done this for me? It's self-seeking. And that is not the way of Christ. What did Christ do? He said, I do always the will of the Father. Not his own will, not what he wanted. Even in the garden, he said, if it be thy will, not my will, but thine. He laid down his life for us. And so man's wisdom is self-seeking. It's also contentious. It's contentious. He says, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts. 
The word strife has the idea of campaigning for an election or trying to win a political office. Now we're coming up on another election season. Praise the Lord for that. Isn't that going to be so much fun for the next four months? I'm so excited about it. We're going to be flooded with advertisements and commercials and yard signs and mailers and people who want our vote and so they will say things and do things just so we can or they can gain our support. I don't think you're going to hear in the next months Donald Trump say something like, well, you know what, Joe Biden is a great man who served our country faithfully for many years, and I appreciate his concern for America, and I'm looking forward to some good, healthy debates. You're not going to hear something like that from him. Conversely, I don't think you're going to hear Joe Biden say, I respect Donald Trump immensely, and I'm so thankful for his leadership for the last four years. No, they are both going to exaggerate their opponent's faults and minimize their own. And on the flip side, they're going to take all the good things that they think they have, and they're going to trumpet those and yell those and preach those, and any shortcomings they're just going to ignore or not talk about. Why? Because they want to win the vote. That's the picture of strife, the wisdom of man. But that's not how Christians should act. If our conduct, let me bring it to where we live, if our conduct is always marked by trying to get ahead, in fighting for a position and a greater status, if we always have to promote ourselves and seek to gain other people's favor, support, wealth, whatever it is, and we have to put others down in the process, that is a sign of worldliness. Now, this happens even in the church. Remember Diotrephes in 3 John? What did he? He loved to have the preeminence. And so he would reject these outside teachers. I don't want them to come in because they might hinder my ability to control the church can happen even in church. It happened to the apostles. Walking with Jesus, the very son of God, and what did they ask him? Jesus, oh, let me ask you this question. Which one of us is going to be right next to you during the kingdom? They were fighting for position even as the son of God was on his way to be crucified. We need to heed the words of Jesus. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You want to know man's wisdom from God's wisdom? Man's wisdom says you get yours. Fight for your own rights. Seek to win your status and gain things for yourself. God's wisdom says you serve, and then God will be the one who will either promote or debase. If you're always in conflict with others, if it seems like you always find yourself in the middle of arguments and disagreements, It may be that you are contentious and living like the world. James says, don't glory in that. Don't boast about how ambitious or difficult you are. Now, some people take pride in the fact. I've heard people say, well, yeah, I just, I don't work well with anybody. I don't play nice with others. I kind of speak my mind and people, if they don't like it, well, that's too bad. I'm just, this is who I am. James says, don't take pride in that. That is not something to glory in. In fact, in verse number 14, when he says, lie not against the truth, He's saying, a professed Christian who lives this way is a fraud. Your your words and your actions are not matching up. And so a contentious, strife-filled person who says they are a believer is really deceiving themselves. You're not living out of what God says. So the character of false wisdom is here, and it is toxic because James goes on to show us the origin of false wisdom. He says, this wisdom, verse number 15, descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Why does it cause so many problems? Because of where it begins. Earthly has to do with having this life only in view. It's exclusively horizontal in its perspective. It is not worried about eternity. It's not worried about spiritual things. It's not worried about the long game and how this is going to uh, play out into people's eternal good. All it wants to do is deal with the here and now. Now, there are many things that only make sense if there is an eternal heaven. And if there's not, if heaven is just an illusion or a myth and this life just ends at our death and then nothing else happens after that, then maybe we should kind of heed the words of some in Scripture who said, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die, right? If there is nothing beyond this life, then we should do everything we can to get as much pleasure, enjoyment, fulfillment here and now. But if we really believe that there is an eternity, then that should change the way we live 
and act. But man's wisdom is earthly because it is, because it is focused only on the temporary. It is sensual. Now, this is not talking about anything sexual. It just means uh, to be natural or fleshly, kind of originating in the, the carnal nature of man. And that's the problem with false wisdom. It always comes from inside of us. Now, we like to imagine that our perspectives are right. If I talk to each one of you individually and we could talk about uh, any number of things, we could talk about politics or economics or uh, any type of business ideas, you're probably convinced that you have at least a good perspective on it. If I talk to you about your job, you would say, yeah, I've got a good handle. I think I know what we should or should not do. None of us thinks that we're a fool going back to the first part of our message. But the reality is, the Bible says we can't even know our own hearts. So how in the world are we going to look out at the world and make accurate judgments on everything going on around us? We all need to trust ourselves a little bit less. I am not as smart as I sometimes think I am. And I want to be rude, but neither are you. And so sometimes tomorrow morning when you wake up and you have thoughts pop into your head, well, this is what we should do at work, this is what we should do as a country, maybe you should just take a step back and say, you know what, I'm probably not as smart and as wise as I actually think I am. Because why? Because man's wisdom is sensual, it's carnal, it's originating inside of us. And then it is devilish. Any supposed wisdom that is gained outside of the word of God is tainted by the influence of Satan. I want to be clear, that's not to say that uh, modern medicine or physics or biology or economics or any of these things are demonic in and of themselves, but it is saying that anything in this world is affected by the prince of the power of the air. So we need to be very careful if we're making judgments on things and we don't have scriptural basis behind it because there is a way in which the systems of this world can twist and taint our understanding we need to be careful to go back to the word of god man's wisdom is self-seeking and contentious and it leads to pride and boasting and the reason is because it is rooted in the world the flesh and the devil and james gives us the results what happens if you live after false wisdom verse 16 he says for where envying and strife is there is confusion and every evil work confusion is a great word in the greek it's translated in chapter number one as unstable. Remember the double-minded man who is thinking different things all the time? The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's the same Greek word here used for confusion. There is always uneasiness and unrest and going back and forth and change and things that are not settled and secure. It's up and down and full of chaos and fighting and division. The picture of someone who's always restless and unsettled, never content, never satisfied, never joyful, always searching for something or someone else to fill the voids in their life. A new job, a new hobby, a new spouse, more possessions, more money, the next vacation, the next event, the next thing to just somehow fill me. And James says, that is confusion. It's a product of worldly wisdom. I've studied this passage. I was struck by how much godly wisdom leads to peace and calm, and how worldly wisdom leads to tension and conflict and unrest. And it is a good reminder for me that if I am feeling inwardly stressed out all the time, worried and anxious and on edge, like I'm, I'm just going to snap at some point, or I need to just get to the next break because things are too chaotic, it might just be that I'm not living out of God's wisdom. So James gives us this picture and this gauge, if there's confusion in your life, could it be that you're living out of man's wisdom? Next, he says, evil works. The word used for evil carries the idea of worthless. It's not just that it is a sinful and immoral, but that it is of no value. R.C. Trench said, it is evil not from the aspect of its active or passive malignity, but rather from its good-for-nothingness the utter impossibility of any true gain ever coming forth from it. Have you ever had those moments where maybe you spend an afternoon, you meant to get some projects done, and maybe you uh, turn on the TV or open your phone and start looking up stuff or scrolling through something, and the next thing you know, an hour or two is gone, and you think, that was completely worthless. I have nothing to show for it. That's the idea of evil works. At the end of it all, it amounts to nothing. 1 Corinthians 1.19 
G, or Paul said, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Paul is echoing Isaiah 29 that said, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. False wisdom is self-seeking, contentious, proud, and the moment that you and I step from this life into the next, we will look back and we will see that it was all worthless. The time you spent arguing on social media with people that you don't know, strife and contention, you're going to look back and say, this was done, this did me no good at all. The time that you spent uh, oh, promoting yourself and seeking to get ahead and doing everything you can to get more and more and more, you're going to look back and say, this was all vanity of vanity. So the question is, do you see your life in the description that James gives? How much of your life is spent for self? How much of your life is spent for God and others? Look back at your calendar. Look back at your time. Look back at your money. All the things that kind of show value. How much of is it self-focused? How much is God and others focused? Are you argumentative and difficult to get along with? Are you proud of what you've made yourself? Man's wisdom. Verse 17 and 18 provide the alternative. Through the indwelling spirit of God, we can experience something far better. We don't have to live that way. We can have peace. And we see here in the origin of true wisdom, kind of walking through the same process, James says, but the wisdom that is from above. In contrast to false wisdom, which is earthly, true wisdom originates in the heavens. Proverbs 2, 7 says, the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. That is why James wrote in chapter 1, if any man lack wisdom, what should he do? Let him look inside himself and try to find it, right? No. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Because it is God who can give to all men generously, liberally, and without reproach. True wisdom is not going to come from going to a good college. If you're in high school right now and you think, well, I want to be a wise person. That means I need to get into this school. Okay, great. If you get into that school, great, but true wisdom is not going to come from any uh, specific institution of higher learning. It's not going to come by doing all sorts of research so you can be extra informed on current events. I read all these places and I, I get to the bottom of things. It's not going to come from your favorite news outlet or a political commentator. True wisdom only, listen, only comes from God. Now, I'm not dismissing the need for study and sound thinking, but we are kidding ourselves if we think we can find wisdom without the Lord. Job 28, 12, Job asked the question, where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Read Job 40. He gets the answer from God. God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I brought forth Leviathan? Where were you when I hung the stars? What is he saying? Job, I'm the place where wisdom is. So if you're looking all these places to gain understanding, what's going on politically? What's going to go on with the end of the world? What's going on with this, with social unrest? What's going on? Look to the Bible. And if you're looking to other places, can I warn you, you might just find that there's more contention and strife and pride and deceit. And it doesn't lead to peace and gentleness and meekness. It's a sign it's worldly wisdom, not godly wisdom. So James answered the question. True wisdom is from above. Next, we see the character of true wisdom. Verse 17 is a list of what genuine wisdom looks like. And the reason Pastor read the Beatitudes is because all of these are found, or the majority of these are found in the teachings of Christ. He says, first, this wisdom that from, is from above is first pure. Now, first is not just referencing the order in which it is given. It is actually talking about the level of importance. Purity refers to an absence of sinful attitudes and motivations. And if we are ever going to have any sort of wisdom, it is going to become because we have a heart that is free of sin. A sinful heart and a wise mind are opposites and they cancel each other out. If you say, well, I'm really, really wise and yet I'm really struggling with all these sins or I'm living in this open sin, James says you're not as wise as you think you are. True wisdom comes from a pure heart. Unlike false wisdom, which is stained by selfishness, true wisdom 
is clean and pure. The writer of Hebrews warned that without holiness, no man shall see God. Do you notice how wisdom begins not in the mind, but in the heart? It's not about what or how much you know, but how pure your life and motives are. So as it's pure next, he says it's peaceable. This is the seventh beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Unlike false wisdom, which is leading to strife, true wisdom is seen in someone who seeks peace rather than conflict. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi in chapter 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Speaking of wisdom, Proverbs 3.17 says, Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. All her paths are peace. You know, our natural tendency is to be argumentative and reactionary. I can look back, and maybe you can too, I can look back to times of my life, even recently, where I like to argue and debate and be a contrarian just for the sake of being a contrarian. Because I'm grumpy and I'm a curmudgeon, somebody says something to me, and I just want to put up a fight. I just want to say the opposite. Why? Because that's, that's my wisdom inside of me, seeking to prove that I'm smart or I'm knowledgeable or whatever, but it's not the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is peaceable. So let me ask you, what's your life marked by? Are you always arguing with people, always debating, always feeling like you have to have the last word, or are you somebody who brings relationships together through peace and the spirit of God? Next, James says, it is gentle. It is gentle. Now, quite a few Greek scholars I read, I don't know Greek all that well. I can use Blue Letter Bible once in a while and I can get an idea of it. But the Greek scholars that I read said that this is a difficult uh, word to translate from Greek to English. There's not really a great word that encapsulates all of it. Gentleness is good, but it doesn't do it justice. There's a lot more entailed in the Greek word about being fair and equitable and reasonable and gentle and, and not seeking to uh, get ahead. Matthew Arnold called it sweet reasonableness. John Phillips said it paints the picture of a person who does not stand up for his rights, but who is willing to make room for others. Jesus, what did he do? When he was reviled, he reviled not again. It's a picture of somebody who may have rights, but is willing to set them aside for the good of a relationship. 2 Timothy 2 Paul is writing to Timothy and encouraging him about how he should be as a pastor. And he said, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient when he is wronged. It is the teaching of Jesus to turn the other cheek or to go the extra mile. Now this is radically different than what we see in the world, isn't it? What is our idea if injustice has been done? Fight, 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 fight. What happens if somebody says something that we disagree with? Argue, 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 argue. What, is, what does James say? It's gentleness. It's even when you're right or you have the rights, being willing to say, okay, I'll just let that go for now because I'm not going to risk ruining a relationship or a friendship or an opportunity to minister to them because I need to have my voice heard. It's gentle. Next, it's easy to be entreated. This kind of goes along with it comes from two Greek words that means well-persuadable. It's not stubborn. It's the idea of you may have an opinion, but you're willing to be convinced that you were wrong. You ever met somebody who it just seems like they're never wrong? doesn't matter. You could show them. They could say, uh, they could say this, this wall back here is white, and you could say, no, 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 it, it's, it's brown. Look at it. And they said, no, no, no. If it's in their head that it's white, they're going to argue until the cows come home that they are right, and they're never going to be convinced otherwise. You can't tell them anything. James says that's not how God's wisdom works. It's a picture of somebody who says, here's what I think, but I'm willing to be shown that I am wrong. It's the idea of teachableness. Doesn't mean you need to be a pushover, but real wisdom knows when to listen and to yield. Like what one person said, they said, we should have strongly, strong convictions loosely held. It's the idea. We're strong in where we stand, but we're willing for God's word to change us. I don't know about you, there's been things that I've been really, really strong on, 
And I was wrong about what the Bible taught. And I needed somebody to show me, no, no, this is what God's word actually says. So many of us, you know what we do? We dig our heels in, say, you will never convince me that what I believe for however long is wrong. James says, it is easy to be entreated. It's willing to listen to wisdom. Next, he says, it's full of mercy. The Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is compassionate and sympathetic. It does not judge others strictly, but is quick to forgive and show kindness, even, even to those who don't deserve it. God is the greatest example of this. Lamentations 3, pastor read it this morning. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Listen about his compassion and his mercies. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I think a lot of times we're willing to be merciful to somebody once or twice, maybe even three times. If we're really generous, somebody can wrong us or hurt us or do us evil, and we will show mercy once, twice, three times, and then we get to the fourth time or the fifth time, and pretty soon we're like, I'm not, no more mercy for you. You exhausted my reserve of being kind and benevolent. What does God do with us? Every morning, his mercies are new. So what is your default position towards those you disagree with? Is it mercy? Do you do what 1 Corinthians 13 says? Charity hopes all things, believes all things, the idea of giving the benefit of the doubt, or do you look for any little reason to condemn and judge and accuse others? That is not the wisdom of God. Next, James says, true wisdom is full of good fruits. This goes back to the first verse of our passage and really the whole message or the message of the whole book of James. Like faith, genuine wisdom is revealed in good conduct. If you think that you are wise, but there is no spiritual fruit in your life, you are deceived. Wisdom is not an intellectual exercise. It is practical living. So you want to know if you have true wisdom? I'll ask you some questions. How well have you loved your neighbor in the last two weeks? Practically, not just mentally, not just, oh yeah, I love my neighbor. What have you done to show love of neighbor in a practical way in the last two weeks? It, wisdom is full of good works. Uh, are you ser serving in your church? Do you have a place where you can minister to others or are you just kind of coming and sitting and leaving and expecting to take, take, take without giving back? Wisdom again is full of good works. Are you exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5? What does the Spirit produce in our lives? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what the fruit that he's talking about here is. So is your life full of these things? If not, then it might be a sign that you don't have the wisdom that you think you have. And lastly, he says it is without partiality and without hypocrisy. A true wisdom has no ulterior motives or hidden agendas, and it doesn't play favorites. It's sincere and honest. If you ever had somebody do something for you, and as you're almost reaching out to receive whatever it is they're giving you, you're kind of hesitant. I wonder what strings are coming along with this kindness or this gift. I wonder what their ulterior motive is. I wonder why they're being so kind to me right now. True wisdom is not like that. It has no hypocrisy. There's no mask behind it. It's genuine, unauthentic. Now that is a portrait of true wisdom, and we see the results in verse number 18. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So what does true wisdom result in? Righteousness and peace. There are plenty of people who the world might think of as possessing great amount of wisdom, but their conduct is anything but righteous. They're living unholy, sinful lives, and James says that is not wisdom. And this verse teaches that if you think you are wise... But you are living in sin, you are deceived. Real wisdom comes from God and it leads to godliness. It also leads to peace. Now we're living in a tumultuous time. There is conflict and division and anger and infighting, even among Christians. But that is not what God desires. As we go through this week, I want you to think about the Beatitudes. This is the great, like Pastor said, the greatest message ever preached straight from the lips of Jesus, the one that we say we love and follow. And what did he say those who live according to his kingdom principles would look like? Peaceable, merciful, have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, pure in heart and eyes, all these things. 
That is what true wisdom looks like. Now at this point, you probably should be thinking, I'm in trouble because I don't measure up very well to this list of what true wisdom looks like. I look a lot more like this uh, worldly wisdom, contentious, argumentative strife, wanting my own way. And that would be, if you're being honest, probably where most of us are. Because the reality is you cannot make yourself pure, righteous, peaceable, merciful, gentle, easy to be entreated. That is not within you to work on yourself and produce that. You have to have something from the outside come in and transform you so you can resemble this characteristics of true wisdom. We need transformation. So what I want to do is leave us with one verse tonight that kind of explains how does this come about? How can my life more resemble this true wisdom than this false wisdom? 1 Corinthians 1.30 says this, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Our hope for true wisdom is found in the person of Jesus Christ and his transforming work that he does in our lives. It is not found in Evan saying, I'm going to work really, really hard to be gentle this week. Now, I think he should work hard at that. But the only way he's going to succeed is by the grace of God working in his life. Same is true for all of us. We need God's help and we need his power. So as you think about true wisdom and false wisdom, maybe I would encourage you tonight during the invitation, just ask the Lord, God, help me live out of true wisdom the rest of this week. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. God, we're so convicted, or at least I'm so convicted by your word and what it means to have true wisdom. Lord, I fall so short so often. Lord, I'm, I'm selfish and proud, and I like to argue and be contentious. God, and I want my own way, and I'm, I'm quick to withhold mercy from people if they wrong me. I'm quick to think the worst of others and uh, think the best of myself. Lord, and I don't want to be that way, but I, I know that I need your help if there's going to be any change in my life. So I pray that the Spirit of God and the person of Jesus would transform me from the inside out, that I would this week be somebody who looks like the Beatitudes, somebody who is pure and peaceable and gentle and merciful, and I hunger and I thirst not after things of this world, but I hunger and thirst after righteousness and things of God. I need your help to do that. Lord, I think our, our church needs your help to do that. So I pray that you would help us tonight. God, to make a commitment that we would follow you with our whole hearts so that you can work this work in our lives. We love you in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me? The piano is going to play. I'm just going to be quiet for a while and allow you to speak to the Lord. If there's somebody in here and you say, I don't know that Jesus is my Savior. I don't know that he has forgiven my sins, but I would like to know more about that. You can find me or Pastor Sanders after the service. We would love to take God's word and show you what it actually means to be a Christian, to have your sins forgiven, to have the, the old nature replaced by the new nature. But for now, Christians, I'm going to allow you a chance to talk to the Lord. Father, we ask tonight, uh, I think if we're honest, all too often we have man's wisdom rather than yours. And I pray tonight as we've heard your word that it would establish changes in our heart and our mind. And Lord, help us to follow you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Bobby, thank you for that message tonight. What a great challenge. I do, I do appreciate that. I apologize. I, I went and sat down. 
And like for the first 30 of your message, I forgot to put my mask on. Then all of a sudden it hit me like, oh, wait, I'm not wearing a mask. And then I finally threw it on. So you looked at me a couple of times. I think maybe you're giving me the eye. I didn't know. So um, sorry about that, church family. Um, just one announcement I want to give, and that is about camps. Um, at this point, we have canceled camps. You probably saw my email I sent out this morning. Uh, but please keep that week open. We are going to have some activities for junior and senior campers, and it is going to be a good time, a lot of fun. Uh, things are in the works there, but uh, keep those calendars, uh, that week open, if you will, um, so we can enjoy that time together. So thanks once again for that message tonight. What a blessing it was. Good to be in God's house tonight. Amen. It was wonderful this morning and great again this evening. Be in prayer uh, this week for one another. Uh, I want to encourage you to reach out to one another, minister and care for one another. Great challenge during the message about doing that. I think that's important for us, especially in this time, to be doing that. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we will be dismissed. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much uh, just for the wisdom that comes from you. Boy, how opposite it is. And just tonight's message drove that home, how opposite it is from what we're hearing in mainstream media and we're hearing in many, many social media posts. And Lord, I just pray that as your people, we'd be holy. Um, we would be different. And I think that holiness is marked in the wisdom that we display. So may our wisdom come from above. May it be peaceable, may it be easily to be entreated. Help us, Lord, with that, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.